We're here in the Connected Cars and Autonomous Vehicle Zone here at London Tech Week 2017. I'm here with Pete from Nest Digital Engineering. Pete, thanks for joining us. Uh, tell me, your company's got a, a, an interesting perspective on the whole connected car ecosystem. Tell me more. Well, for us, a car is just software on wheels, uh, uh, just another digital platform. And we've been working in digital platforms across a whole variety of sectors for many years, including automotive. And we just see it very naturally that we focus increasingly on connected cars. Because it all comes back to three main areas. One, usability and security, which not always in sync. Secondly, these are highly complex platforms that are being assembled. Very difficult to pull all the pieces together. And thirdly, very, very large volumes of data that have to be managed across these platforms. You talk about a car as a, as a digital platform. Uh, give me an example of another digital platform to help us make sense of where the car fits in then. Okay, if we think of um, gas turbine generators that are sat on oil rigs, sat in hospitals, big utilities, there you've got a big piece of hardware and they think of it as a piece of hardware, but in reality, it's got a couple of hundred sensors on there pulling in all the data, feeding it back to the manufacturer, who can then say, I don't need to shut it down for periodic maintenance now. I do have to do that. I must do this. This is important. This is the remaining useful life of that platform. So that's moving away from thinking of a piece of hardware to a digital platform that's, in that case, providing electricity as a service, perhaps. Um, so what sort of uh, connected experiences are you hoping, uh, helping automotive companies to bring to market? Well, we've been working for over 10 years now with the guys who essentially invented 2 and 3D mapping and sat-nav. So that's been a core focus. We work in both active and passive safety systems, so restraint and uh, night vision, vision products. On the telematics side, we work with a major supplier who's helping fleet management, insurance companies deliver efficient services out to their in internal uh, fleet owners. And um, who else do we have? I think that covers it for now. Yeah. So um, where do you see this going? What's the, what's the sort of next step, the, I guess the short-term vision and then, uh, and then the medium-term vision of all of this stuff being brought together? The one I've forgotten was, of course, the obvious one, infotainment. Uh, what are we going to do with the passengers in you know, the car where increasingly they'll have nothing to do on that three-hour motorway journey? So we see it coming, all these Lego blocks really f fitting into three buckets. One, what's happening to the car. Secondly, what's happening to the passengers and the, the driver, if such a role exists. And finally, Whose car is it going to be anyway? Who's going to own it? What's the commercial model going to be for transportation? So you've got three buckets there, I suppose. How do you see the different stakeholders uh, working with those three buckets in terms of manufacturers and, and passengers and so on? It's very clear now that highly autonomous driving will happen. It's not a technology problem to be solved anymore. It's social, it's legislative, it's cultural. It's a um, critical mass thing. At what point will there be autonomous vehicles driving around our cities, our motorways, and so on? So that's a matter of how we as a society, society will adopt that. So that's quite an easy one. The interesting one is that for the passengers and the, the in quotes, driver, I don't think it's that there's going to be a pure in-car solution. It will be connected to whichever intelligent assistant um, you have in your home. So when Apple Siri or Google Alexa or HAL 2020 wakes you up and says, Pete, you have to be in Dorset this afternoon to see a house builder. I've arranged for your favorite BMW here at 11.30 and Sony have um, suggested a playlist for you. Alternatively, well, if I get you an SUV for 10.30, you could drop the kids off at the park, 
and, you know, make a bigger thing of it. And actually there's a special from Sky on Frozen 4 available. So these are all the sorts of areas that we can foresee in the future. Which brings to question the whole concept, and I think it's going to be a much bigger point that from a society point of view we're going to get used to, which is the whole access over ownership thing. Who owns the car? Is it going to be car sharing, pooled cars, or are we going to be owning our electric cars in the first instance, or, or, or autonomous cars in the first instance? I think there's a lot of debate here. I mean, a lot of the thinking is thinking of the core audience being a millennial living in the city centre. You know, millennials get married, they have kids, they have dogs, they want to go to the beach. The paraphernalia that they take around with them to do that, the stuff that lives in the car because there's nowhere else for it to live, makes that a lot more complex question. But ultimately, car ownership, you know, one-to-one, -one, I think is, is unlikely. Fleet share, car share, perhaps but then if you group together, actually everybody wants the SUV on a weekend. Yeah. So if you're all a very homogenous group, it's not going to work out. Will you call up an Uber or a Lyft or whatever? A lot of complexity, as I said, about getting the millennials. A more extreme, though, if I am comfortable with somebody else worrying about how and what I get there, is why don't I just buy travel miles from my bank, from Jaguar Land Rover, from Southwest Trains. If I can say, well, I need to do this in a month and I have 250 pounds to spend on travel, do I care how I get there necessarily? On occasions, yes, but very often, no. So it's gonna be a very interesting battle to see who wins that. I don't think it's clear at the moment and what the travel brand of the future will be really is very unclear because everybody wants my £250 a month. Once again, it's not necessarily a technology challenge, it's more of a cultural challenge and uh, all around the, the processes, I suppose, because like you say, the technology's there, it's, it's the business models, it's how it, how it all fits into our society. They're the unanswered questions. And I think the, the key for who will be the winners at the moment are going to be the people who can deliver what we term exquisite design. It must work, it must be there, I must be able to use it. But underlying a very secure, robust platform that works, because this is a highly complex environment driving at high speeds. So mistakes are not acceptable. Of course. Uh, listen, Peter, fascinating to chat with you. Pete, uh, Pete Rogers from Nest Digital Engineering, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.